Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Blue Stein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind, and this is another in a series of programs that relate to our quickly and dramatically aging society. Key to our conversation, once again, is the MacArthur Foundation's research network on an aging society, which asks us to imagine a society with many more seniors with walkers than youngsters in strollers. When those over age 60 clearly outnumber those under 15, and which asks us to consider realistically what Americans will have to do to accommodate these new demographic facts of life. Here again today is the chair of MacArthur's Aging Society Network, Dr. John Rowe of Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. Earlier, Dr. Rowe led Harvard's program in academic geriatrics, was president and CEO of Mount Sinai Hospital and Medical School in New York, then served as president and CEO of Aetna, the healthcare organization. With Dr. Rowe today is another member of MacArthur's Aging Society Network, Dr. Lisa Berkman, an internationally renowned social epidemiologist whose work focuses extensively on social and policy influences on health outcomes. Dr. Berkman is the director of the Harvard Center for Population and Development Studies. And I want to begin today by asking whether Dr. Berkman has earlier called the health divide between the United States and other developed countries, ranking us in the bottom half of industrialized countries in life expectancy diminishes in any meaningful way the urgency we should feel about preparing for the needs of an older society. What's Thank the situation there? Well, the situation is as you describe it, we sit at the bottom of OECD countries in terms of life expectancy, and that makes the problem-solving venture even more critical. And the amazing thing about life expectancy in our rankings is that we weren't always like that. If we go back to 1950s or 1940s and we look at our ranking, we were doing really well. About 1940s, 50s, we were fourth and fifth for men and women, respectively, um, in life expectancy. So this drop in life expectancy has occurred over the last half century. And as we start to think about what are the reasons that that's happened, work pro work pops up very prominently as one of the explanations. What do you mean work? So when we made work policies, many of them were made at around the time that Social Security came in, either before World War II or just after. And at that point, we were a very different, different society. Very few women were in the workforce. Life expectancy for people in 1950 was only a few years after, after being 65. So when you think about Social Security, Social Security was devised for people in the last couple of years of their life. And now we face a society that's dramatically different, dramatically, dramatically different, where women are in the workforce, most women have young children, um, and they remain in the workforce, and we have an aging society in which people live longer and longer, and yet we haven't adapted how we think about work to those kind of changing demographic circumstances. Well, wouldn't you say, though, Linda, that, uh, Lisa, that 
even though the United States has a relatively low life expectancy compared to other developed countries, it doesn't mean we don't have an aging society problem. Right. What it means is we're going to have an aging society problem later than these other countries. So that uh, Germany, with respect to its age distribution, currently looks like the United States will look in 2030. Because we had a baby boom, and many of these other countries after World War II had a baby bust. And what that means is that we're still going to have an aging society and everything that is entailed yes. with that. And maybe we have something to learn from the fact that these other countries have gone through this transformation previous to our transformation. Of course, which yeah. leads me to ask the question, have they gone through it well? Have they been wise in adapting their work policies and other policies to this fact? Well, I would say uh, that we're currently seeing in France um, a conflict between uh, the policymakers who feel that the wise thing to do is to advance the retirement age and the preferences of some proportion of the population who are in the streets about it. Um, some of the Scandinavian countries have been smoother in mm -hmm. this transition, mm -hmm. but there's been a cost in terms of taxes and perhaps economic growth. Right. I would say nobody's done this well. Nobody's done this well yet. Nobody has, no country has totally recognized the extent to which this kind of a demographic transition is um, likely to cause an upheaval in how people have to face work and family. And so Scandinavian societies and a lot of the EU countries have been really conscious of work in terms of work-family balance, but very few have adapted to issues of an aging society. It's taking everybody by surprise. Well, of course, I'm fascinated that in recent times how the New York Times has picked up the issues that you are addressing yourselves to. Just the other day, Natasha Singer writes about the financial time bomb of longer yes. lives and says, first the good news, we're living longer, healthier lives than ever before. Now for the bad news. At this rate, we can't afford to live so long. What right. do we have to do in the workplace? What social policies right. are you devising and hoping yeah. that will be yeah. adopted? So I think, I think they fall into three areas. Um, we often focus on retirement as the obvious one, but actually retirement is only one and probably not even the central one that we have to think about. So when we think about work redesign, about how we have to fundamentally reorganize how work is organized, um, we think about retirement, we think about workplace flexibility, um, and I'll talk about a little bit about what we mean about workplace flexibility, not necessarily dramatic things, but things like vacation days or sick days or leave policies. And third, I think we have to think about part-time work. So if I take the last one first, part-time work is really rare in the United States. Um, it turns out that, you know, Americans work more hours than any other country in the United States, and mostly we're dual wage earners. So both members of a family are in the workforce. Um, other countries do much better at defining times and throughout the life cycle, not just when we're old, but there are lots of times throughout the life cycle where it would be really healthy for us to be able to work part-time. Well, why, why, why do we, as different from other countries, work so hard? You say we in the United States yeah. work longer and harder than yeah. people do in other countries. Yeah. Why is that? That's the million-dollar question. <laughs> that is the million-dollar question. The trillion-dollar question. The trillion-dollar question because we don't really know. Um, I mean, part of it is undoubtedly a work ethic that we have, um, that we just keep striving. Part of it is about inequality and the amount of financial resources that we feel we need to have. Um, lots of it is spread across um, very unequally, so people who are at the bottom need to work a huge number of hours and need both members of a family in the workforce just in order to survive. Um, in some ways, but other countries seem to have understood that families are important, balance, times between work and family are important, and this is something that defines an aging society, but 
it turns out it's good for everybody. This isn't only about old people. It's about people with young children. It's about people who are taking care of their partners. It's about people who are taking care of their parents. It's going to affect all of us in some but, way. But the paradox, Maybe if, the paradox is that on the one hand, we say we work harder and longer than anyone else. On the other hand, we say the solution to our problem is to work longer. Right. The solution <laughs> to our problem is to keep people in the workforce, uh, keep them engaged, keep them productive, uh, and find ways to do that. And one way to do that is to raise the retirement age from a policy point of view. And, uh, but there are other ways to do it. And the other ways to do it are to incent people to stay in the workforce, give them bonuses if they work to age 70, have the employers uh, not have to pay Social Security tax for their older workers, have more flexibility. When I was at Aetna, we had a lot of workers who worked at home. And in fact, I remember one year, the worker of the year was a worker who worked at home. Um, and so there are many more flexible approaches that we can have to try to help people adapt to maintaining some economic productivity. But what do you do, quite seriously, at a time when we have such high unemployment rates, when there are so many people, younger people, out of work. Do you say... He's falling into the trap, isn't he? Okay, <laughs> fine. Go ahead. I, I, you were waiting for that. Crowding yeah, in, we've crowding been waiting. out. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Answer. Um, one of the myths about aging that our MacArthur network ha has uh, been working on is, uh, is the view that you have to get older workers out of the workforce to make room for the younger workers. Certainly sounds intuitive, but you can't prove that. And in fact, there are now studies in the United States uh, by Wise and his colleagues and, st and studies in uh, the European Union mm -hmm. by Borsch Supan and his colleagues that clearly show that uh, when older age employment is up, younger age employment is up. That what, it is, what you need is a strong economy and that uh, getting unemployment in older age groups does not foster employment in younger age groups. Right. Would you agree with I, that? Yeah, exactly. I think that's exactly the situation, is that it's hard to prove. It's not, it's not totally locked up. But societies which have um, high, like high retirement ages actually have higher employment for younger people. So, for instance, when you look at France right now, it has high unemployment. It also has really early retirement. So it's not like retirement is um, helping to find jobs for younger people. So it's an anathema. But I think the issue of retirement has to be coupled with these issues of workplace flexibility and the idea that there will be times in your life when you go in and out of the labor force without kind of completely losing ground. Right now, we lose, if we drop out of the labor force, we never get back in. We never get back in where we are because the United States is so competitive and somewhat rigid in how it ranks people. So if we were more flexible, we could extend retirement, have more flexibility, and allow people to kind of flow in and out at times in their lives when they needed that kind and, of And a very interesting aspect of this issue of it, should it be young workers or old workers, is the observation, again, this was uh, by uh, uh, Boris Supan in Germany in a Mercedes Ben's light truck assembly plant where they had young, young teams of workers and they had teams of older workers and they had mixed age teams. And it was the mixed age teams that were really the best. They had a mix of speed and accuracy, uh, experience and strength, whatever it was. And um, it would suggest that it's really not one or the other but both. Do you think you can get over the that hurdle, the myth that you say that I inadvertently uh, we trapped fell into. you. I think we trapped you. <laughs> do you think we can do that? I you think said it was counterintuitive. I, I think that um, as a former CEO of a major corporation, yeah. I think that CEOs are very evidence based, and that if we can articulate uh, the facts, uh, we should have evidence based policies that will come both out of local and state and federal governments, but also at corporations will develop their policies based on the evidence. They want to be successful for themselves and their shareholders. And uh, if we can show them the evidence, I think we can change 
the policies. What about the more human, less economic situation um, aspect of this? Um, we older people, I'm not talking about you kids, we older people are so very concerned about what happens to us when we don't work. Uh, use it or lose it, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, do you think there is much to the notion that one has to keep active, yeah. to keep one's marbles at least? Yes, yes. The, the, the easy answer to that is yes, that almost all the evidence that we have suggests that people who are socially engaged, whether it's at work or in their lives, um, maintain their cognitive functioning more, maintain their physical functioning more, and are able to both contribute to society and receive. And when we talk about social engagement among us, we're not talking about social support. We're not talking about what you get from people. It's what you give to people. So by being at work and socially engaged, you're more likely to maintain your cognitive functioning. Um, and it's because you creative, um, you have to, you're constantly confronted with situations in which you have to problem solve. Um, you know, one of the things that people have done in the cognitive um, neuroscience field is try to improve memory, and they've done a lot of tests to try to improve memory. And so far, what they've said is that if you teach people to do crossword puzzles, they get better at crossword puzzles. If you teach people to do Sudoku, they get better at Sudoku. But they don't get better at anything else. It doesn't extend to their life. The thing about work that's so important is that it seems to be able to generalize so that it extends to your life. It's able, it makes you more able to problem solve and be creative in the rest of your life. You're not learning one little task. You're learning a set of things that enable you to live in the world. It turns out to be really important. Why don't the French, the workers in France, understand that they're fighting against the increasing uh, the retirement age? Maybe what, because years? they're French. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't say that no, no, no. On, so on the open mind. <laughs> no, two, no. two serious things about France. So. French people live longer than almost anybody. They have the secret, as far as I'm concerned, to longevity. Um, it is actually a very healthy balance between work and the rest of their life. Um, they stay engaged across a number of fields. So when French people drop out of the workforce, when they retire, they remain quite socially engaged. But I think there are two things going on in France right now. One is very short-sighted. I mean, they just um, are very... Um, centered on preserving privileges and rights that they, that they worked hard for. So unions argue against that. Um, and they're just resisting. There's no logic to it. Of course, retirement chain should change in France. But the other thing that's more complicated, which I've heard and, and is not necessarily proven, is that a lot of people are worried about job security in France. And so their years between 60 and 62 may not be filled with their jobs as they see them right now. They may be filled with unemployment. And You're if they fall were going to the be trap too, are you? <laughs> unemployed, well, they don't know. So what they see themselves as guarding against is unemployment, not two more years of working life. They see themselves as potentially guarding themselves against being unemployed for a long time. Uncompensated unemployment. Right. Um, I think one of the other aspects of the um, United States um, that people feel if they're not working, they're out of it, you know, that things are over, is that we don't, in this country, value activities that are not monetized. If you're working in the economy and you have a paycheck and you're producing something, that's part of the ideal. But if you're, as we've spoken in previous shows, if you're volunteering in the community and you can be doing so with full engagement, and very substantial productivity, but it's not monetized, it's not counted in dollars. And until we find a way to measure those activities and, and add them to the financially productive activities as a true measure of someone's productivity, we're not really going to give full weight to those activities. Do you think we have a chance to do that? Well, I think we do. We think that uh, in our group we're working on uh, new approaches rather than the GDP, you know, uh, new approaches mm -hmm. to measure uh, productivity of a society beyond just the financial productivity. And we think that those kinds of measures um, 
can be an important supplement to GDP? Well, look, I know that as a physician, you're a, a totally enlightened person. And so I suspect uh, that as a businessman, as chairman of um, a, a great insurance, health insurance company that you were too, uh, and you talk about your policies there as CEO of Het Aetna. What role, however, has got to be played by government, has got to be played by enlightened industry in bringing about the policy changes that you think are so important right. in the workplace? Um, well, we should both take a crack okay. at this. Um, I think in terms of changing policy, there have to be government um, sort of policies that promote a long life and a healthy workforce. Um, at the same time, I think increasingly there are companies um, in the private sector who recognize that this could be a win-win. So maybe I could give you two examples of that. We're doing a study now in a long-term care company, very, very large long-term care company, um, and we're trying to increase workplace flexibility and increase um, work-family balance for people. The company sees this as important because they think it's going to be better for their bottom line. They think they're going to reduce turnover, they're going to reduce sickness absence, because right now, especially in a mostly female labor force, um, they see the biggest threats to their company surviving um, being related to work-family issues. So people call out all of a sudden because they've got to take care of somebody, or they quit because they can't um, stay in that workforce. So they constantly lose the most talented people. Right? They constantly lose the most talented people. So they're hoping that a kind of an initiative which increases flexibility will be good for the bottom line and good for the health of their employees and families. Um, so that's a, that's a private sector right. initiative that could be really important. On the public side, um, the United States, again, is one of the only countries in the world that does not have parental leave. Now, you may not think this is related to aging. I actually think it's just the flip side. It's we just don't imagine how we're going to incorporate times at work where people need to be out. Um, and other places, there's a very, very famous study in South Africa where they gave older people pension plans turn out to spill over to younger people. So I think as a government, we could think of policies that are win-win, and they're win-win for younger people, and they're win-win for middle-aged people in the workforce, and they're win-win for older people. And that's the kind of creative approach that we need to be thinking. I would just underline the last comment that it's really not just about the elderly. It's right. about our society. It's about all the age groups. And we need a comprehensive set of public and private policies across the life course. And if we can change the life course in terms of education throughout midlife and uh, opportunities for flexibility in the workforce then, then we're going to be delivering to late life a, uh, a fitter or a better educated, more prepared workforce that can more easily continue until later in life. So we really need to think about the society. Yeah. And as, it'll be good for young people, too. And it's good for young people, and it's good for middle-aged people, and it's good for the elderly. It's not just a fix on the elderly. And ch changing that frame of reference is very tough. Well, I wonder whether it isn't even tougher today um, as we look at a political situation in which the notion of getting government out, and that's why I asked the question mm -hmm. of what government's involvement must be. We're talking about an um, industry-based change. I guess that's not uh, that impossible. But I would think you would feel up against a stone wall. Yes and no. I, I think that um, there are things going on in the economy and in the political uh, debates that, uh, that might make it harder to introduce these changes. On the other hand, as you pointed out, um, the media is now replete with articles about the aging yeah. society. And here we are on your show and doing several segments. Right. We've been pushing this rock up, up the hill a long time. It's right. taken us years <laughs> to become an overnight sensation uh, here and uh, in terms of people's interest. Well, I, I really wonder then why we are laggards 
in this, why we Americans are so far behind Because the line. we're aging later. You mean and that's I, and good the, or bad? The, the point you made in the introduction about an aging society is more people over 60 than under 15. Germany was there in 1981. We're going to be there in 2013. The baby boom generation diluted the elderly in our society. It was all about youth. It was all about that generation. And we re really haven't had to face these problems as early as those other countries. That's why we're laggards, because we're laggards from the demographic transformation. That's a very interesting point to make. Does it make you more hopeful now? You're saying we're yes. going to run up against this problem. And we, we've learned what works and what doesn't work uh, in some of these other developed countries, and that's got to be helpful. In, in the two minutes we have remaining, and I'm sorry that so little time, what do you think is the most important reform that's needed here, the most important social policy change? So from my perspective, I think of the most important we policy change we could do would be to rethink work, both in terms of retirement, in terms of workplace flexibility, and in terms of part-time work. It's got to be an orientation to work that's not a single arrow, but really thinking about how we can work and live to be 90, and have children, and take care of people. It's got to be all of those things sort of put together um, in a policy that's, that's oriented towards taking care of families, as well as maximizing our engagement throughout an entire life cycle. Do you find that the uh, importance of the computer and of the possibility of working at home via the computer has changed this picture yes, in any way? Yeah. I think that, that flexibility policies that allow people to work at home or in the hours they want to is a clear, clear bonus. The only downside of that is lots of people don't have those kinds of jobs. Lots of people who are working at manual jobs or face jobs, all of health care, our, our intervention for health care, all of those people have to be there. There's nothing they can do at home. It's a FaceTime job. So only some of our jobs are going to be like that. But for the people who have them, terrific. I think the skeptics about the computer aspect of, of this point to the digital divide that, that a very small proportion of older households are connected to the internet compared to younger households. We think that's what's called a cohort effect. As, as, the, as the population ages, that the current middle age and, and young old uh, individuals who are wired will uh, continue to be wired and continue to participate. Well, of course, I'm wired, and the wire yeah. tells me that we've run out of time. But thank you so very much, Dr. Berkman. Thank you. And Dr. Rowe for joining me again. Appreciate Terrific. it. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time. Meanwhile, as an old friend used to say, good night and good luck. And do visit our Open Mind website at 13.org slash openmind.